What a difference a week makes. I came into the parsonage last Sunday and turned the air on. I came this morning and turned the heat on. <laughs> you know what? This change of weather, the cool air, it triggers in some men, maybe some ladies, but in some men, the need to hunt. <laughs> Now, there's a lot of things you don't know about me. Thank you for praying, by the way. I'm doing a lot better. Those ribs, they're just sore if I bump into something. But I want to share a little part of my testimony. Um, you see, hunting is something that I don't do as much nearly like I used to. Uh, I'm actually a licensed avid hunter in um, almost all 50 states. You have to have special license. And I thought I'd brag a little bit. Uh, don't like to talk about myself, but since hunting season started, both in North and South Carolina. Now, I don't know about you South Carolina guys, but your laws are way nicer than North Carolina. They've gotten so persnickety, they tell you which week certain game can be hunted. And whether you use gun or bow, down in South Carolina, they've made it a lot, in my opinion, easier and better. But I'd like to ask the men here if they have hunted to the degree I have. I've hunted all over. The West, Midwest, down in the South, up in the Northeast. And I thought I'd read you a list of things that um, I've uh, killed. Uh, deer, turkey, rabbit, squirrel, fox, possum, raccoon, duck, goose, Groundhog, chipmunk, skunk, rat. Now I told you, I've hunted things that some of you would never think of doing. Mouse, turtle, snake, dog, cat, many various birds, bats. I could go on and on. So you have to have a very special license to do that. And I forgot to bring mine in, but it's called a driver's license. <laughs> I have killed... All those things with my car. I never tried to. And some have done great damage. But this morning I, I do want to I do want to warn you about a creature. He's not human. But Peter wanted us to understand at the end of first Peter. Look at verse eight. By the way, the title of my message is When the Devil Hunts. Because the devil's hunting right now. You do know the devil's not God. He's not uh, omniscient, omnipresent. He's somewhere right now. And I would imagine he's somewhere on earth trying to do what Peter's warning us about. He said, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Father, help me now as I preach these next few minutes to remind my brothers and sisters about a very, very real enemy. Father, he doesn't hunt for fun. He doesn't hunt for food. He hunts God's people to destroy them. And I pray that we take the warning and take it to heart. Help me now. Lord, if anyone's here without Christ, oh, I pray they'll be saved today. Father, they're not out of Satan's uh, watch. Uh, Father, they are part of Satan's family. And I pray that you'd save them. Put them in your family. And then put, help them with the armor of God. Help First Baptist Church, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to see quickly, just number one, the predator. The predator is described in verse 8. I want you to notice there are two words used here that describe his attributes. First of all, notice it says, because your adversary, then the second word, devil. That word adversary um, is, the, is the name Satan. Satan in the Old Testament and New Testament, whether Hebrew or Greek, translated in our English, is from the same thought, an adversary. The word adversary is a courtroom term. It's a person who is standing before a judge accusing you. And Satan loves, loves to go before God, as we'll see in a minute, Job. He did that to Job. And he does it to you and me. But secondly, the devil. The, the, the word devil 
Lerda means slanderer. It's the Greek word diablos. And the, his, he is an adversary, but his favorite activity is to go before God and or go into a church house or go into a Christian home or maybe to come up next to you and me and say slanderous things. Do you realize that the greatest damage done in churches on any given day in this country are not done by lost people or government people. They're done by God's people. I just had two of our graduates. Um, uh, they've been out a long, they're in their 50s now. Long before Henry and Sarah came to school. And they both called and they just, hey, Brother Spencer, whenever someone says, do you have a minute? Okay, sure. And both are good men. They have wonderful churches. One in Sumter and uh, the other one up in Tennessee. And they just said, I need to talk to you. And they're having some issues. Pastors do. Well, they said, um, what would you do in this case? And they told me, and I happen to know the people that are giving them a hard time, because I interim pastored there. And, um, you know, uh, I prayed with them, told them I pray for them every day this week, and I'd call them and check on them. You know, both men in sharing their heartbreak, I mean, they weren't, it wasn't devastating, and they're not going to leave. But they've been there long enough. It causes heartburn for the pastor and his wife. They're like, why would you? We, these, we, we thought they were loyal and faithful people, and they were our friends. And you know what? The devil loves to get church members all stirred up. And whether it's a little truth they make it into a mountain, or it's a lie, but it gets passed around. He's the slanderer, the devil. But notice his actions here. Peter very carefully describes Satan like a lion. The word as means like a roaring lion. Did you know in Peter's day the most ferocious land animal known in that part of the world was the African lion? And the African lion would um, live from Africa all the way up through Israel. They, they literally lived in that area. David, you know, killed the lion. Shepherds had to protect their sheep from wolves and lions. The adult male lion can weigh up to 500 pounds. And when his claws are extended, one claw can be six inches long. Now listen, Satan doesn't ever come literally like a lion. But he behaves like a lion. I'd like you to consider the one description, a roaring lion. From what I've studied... The African lion roars for very few reasons. They don't make it a habit of roaring all the time. But when they choose to roar, there are a couple reasons. The one that I've watched on um, National Geographic is on the plains of Africa. Male lions will often, when there's a herd of wildebeest or zebra or some animals that they want to eat, the lion, to get the herd to move, because remember, lions are cats. All cats, all cat animals, whether a lion or domestic, they, God's made their eyes so they can see very clearly at night. But one weakness cats have is they can't see something that's standing still. It has to move. Now once something moves, the cat zeroes in on it. I've actually witnessed this Years ago, we lived in a little trailer that we were renting before when we first went to Ambassador, 27 years ago. And um, a mouse came up the bathroom floor uh, in a water line, and our cat was there. And I stood there and watched. The mouse came up, and as soon as it saw the cat, it froze. And our cat just moved all around, and I'm going... Uh, I didn't say anything. I just, How long is it going to be before our cat... Is, I see the mouse... Walked around it. I, I kind of walked up near the mouse and the cat was following me, you know, kind of rub up my legs. And I just kept going. It, but as soon as that mouse moved, that cat, poof, too late, went down the hole. Now think about this. Peter says, Satan's not limited like a cat's eye. But Satan will, like a roaring lion, Lions will, the male will often put his muzzle to the, the Serengeti plain. And it said that when he roars, the sound will go for miles. And as soon as a herd hears that, often they'll start running. That's when the female lions, that's what they've been waiting for. The herd to move. Now you stay with me. Stay with me. 
It's when the herd moves that lions are very particular about who they'll try to take down. And that's what Peter says. He says, the devil as a roaring lion walketh about. The ETH ending in our King James Bible on a verb always means continuously. Satan is always, uh, listen, he never sleeps. Did you know Satan has never gotten tired? He's never, his blood sugar's never gotten too low. He needs a nap. He doesn't stop to eat or sleep. The Bible tells us again, Satan, like a roaring lion, unlike a normal lion that has to sleep, Satan is always walking about, look at this, seeking whom, the word whom is very particular. In our English, whom means one. So like a herd, lions don't just attack the bulls. They don't attack the herd. When it runs, they have this uncanny God-given ability to look for certain kind of animals whom he may devour. You might not know this, but the word devour is a phrase that literally means to swallow down, to gulp down. He's not trying to nip you. He's not trying to uh, uh, nip at your married life or, you know, uh, scratch your grandchildren. His job is to find that Christian and destroy them completely. Now, with that said, since the Bible, I didn't, the Bible pictures him as a roaring lion, you should be aware of number two, the prey. Number one, the predator. It's Satan. He's alive. He's not been weakened. If anything, he's smarter than he was back when Peter wrote this. He's been watching humanity and human nature. And not for lost people. This isn't written to lost people. But for Christians, he will go after certain Christians. And I believe because the Bible chose to picture him as a lion, I can easily then ask you, what kind of animals do lions hunt? Remember, they do not hunt to take down a herd. They hunt and run a herd to find one. And if you watched any National Geographic or animal videos um, of hunting, it is sad. But I'd like to ask you, right now, think about what kind of Christians Satan likes to go after. You say, well, he, obviously the preacher. Well, maybe. But typically, I think, first of all, the kind of animals that lions love to take down are the lame or injured. Haven't you watched those videos? When a herd runs, they always can pick up the one animal that's limping, trying to run, but because of a, either a deformity or an injury, they just can't keep up. The lion will go after them. It reminds me of what Paul tells us in Galatians 6, 1, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. I think of another animal, maybe the saddest one, the babies. Um, my daughters, my wife and I, I remember when they were little, they loved to have mom and dad sit and watch animal videos. But when it came to hunting, my middle daughter, who I saw yesterday, the one that's going to give me a granddaughter <coughs> in February, and I, I, she has to send me every checkup. She has to send me something. Okay, But uh, she's doing fine. Baby's growing. Uh, the little girl is in the 36th percentile. Not too big. Not too little. She still hasn't picked a name. So if you'd like to write down names that I can give her, I'll take them on my way. But um, Stephanie was the tender-hearted one. And we'd watch videos. And um, <coughs> every time, and we could watch a Western. And, uh, you know, Indian, Calvary, uh, Western. As soon as a horse goes down, my daughter would go, Daddy, Daddy, what happened to the horse? Is the horse, she didn't care about the hero? Or the Native American Indian? It was a horse. We watched Bambi together. The original Disney Bambi. My daughter got as far at the beginning of the show. You know the scene where Bambi's, um, is it mother? Runs over the hill and there's a bang! My daughter said, Dad, Dad, Daddy, what happened to his, what happened to his mommy? And I said, well, what do you think? My older daughter says, come on, Stephanie. She's dead. <laughs> Why, Daddy? Well, someone shot her. That was a gun. My daughter 
Christ got up, ran to a room, wouldn't come down for the rest of the show. That's Stephanie. And when we tried to watch any African lion hunt, if it was a baby that's about to go down, and you know, that's really sad. The little baby, you know, they're born to where within minutes they can stand, and within a few more, they can run. They can outrun a herd. She would just start crying. Daddy, who's get that baby? And I said, I know. I know. It's a part of sin stuff. That's what happened to the animal kingdom. But I think of baby Christians. Baby Christians, uh, if they're not cared for by the herd, I always thought that's kind of funny. We could call a church a herd. There are bull elephants or wildebeest, the stronger men, and then there's the stronger women, but there's baby Christians, and they need our help. They need our protection. You've seen the videos where the lions will try to get a little baby uh, gazelle, gazelle, and it's trying to run. But all of a sudden, the lines get it, and the mother, she stops, and, or, or the, the males will come in. But a mom, I've watched uh, female gazelles and wildebeest literally take on three or four lines, just trying to protect her little child. And most of the time, it doesn't work. They wear her down, run her off, and they get that little baby. And it's, it, it's just the way it is. I think of one more, though. And this one... I think bothers me the most because of my testimony and the fact that I teach young people that are very precious to me. There's one more animal. It's the one that wanders from the herd. I remember watching a Nat National Geographic. They were um, antelopes. And those are pretty strong animals. But the, the guy doing the voice over said, watch this adolescent male. He's strong. He looks almost as strong as the bulls, but he's still with his mother. Watch as he begins to wander a little bit and spots some really green grass. He walks and stops, sniffs the air, looks back. There's his mom. There are the bulls. But man, that sure looks good. And then he walks a little further, sniffs, looks back. Mom's not too far. They're the bulls. And eventually he gets to that spot. All around him were lions. And they were waiting. And when they calculated he was just far enough away, guess what? The first lion runs out, cuts off his run back to mom and the bulls. And so the antelope, and what was fascinating is the voiceover guy said, Now watch, as a strong, young, male antelope, this adolescent, he takes off. And he's so muscular. And he leaps 10 feet and leaps in the lions. What's sad is the adolescent doesn't know the lions aren't r running full bore. Oh, they're running after him. But they're kind of pacing themselves. And they cut off his turn to, you know, he's trying to make a wide circle back to his herd. They just cut that off. And he runs. And he ru and, but after a while, he starts slowing down. And after a while, and the lions, you know, they don't, they don't overrun him because he's strong. He's got horns. But after a while, he falls down. And as soon as he falls down, there's three or four lionesses. They begin grabbing his windpipe. And, they begin, and then the male eventually shows up. And it's dinner time. You know, I remember watching that and thinking about lions. The way Peter describes Satan. How many young people in our churches, raised in Christian homes. Some that go to Bible college, but they drop out. And they think, I'm okay. Oh, I know what I've been taught. I know where the herd, where truth is. And they think, I'm not doing anything really that wicked. And they kind of, and then they get another job offer or a girlfriend in their community college or a boyfriend. And they think, wow, but she's so pretty. He, he's made such promises. And there's mom. I go home. I'm still going to church. It happens every day in this country, thousands of times in America. Young people who are raised right and who were strong, they make a decision. Like in the animal world, Satan cuts them off. Believe me, on this I'm an expert. Because I've been teaching. I've been in ministry 42 years, 30 in Bible college. There are hundreds of heartbreak stories I could tell you. We even tell our students... Ad ambassador, don't be like this. Some do. 
anymore. It's happening more often because they have smartphones. And they watch and they hear voices. Uh, let me tell you. <laughs> the Bible goes on to say, Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5.14, now we exhort your brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. Church, I remind you that you may be small, but Satan and his demons will look to pick off one member at a time. So number one, the predator. Number two, the prey. But number three, I want to give you the protection. This will take up the rest of our time. If you go back and look with me, Beginning and in verse 5, Paul actually, or Peter actually gives us, all of us, all of us are included in these verses, the way that you and I can defeat Satan. He's going to come. Now, if he doesn't come, he's going to send a demon. But I think just my short time back at First Baptist, there are some people that are gone already. Others that might be in danger. Please listen. The first thing... He says in verse 5, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another. In the first four verses of chapter 5, he reminds pastors, you learn to submit to Christ. Pastors have their own distinct dangers, and Peter warns them of that. But beginning in verse 5, he talks to all God's people. And he says, the first thing, you and I to be protected from an attack of Satan is we must learn biblical submission. The word submission means to remain under, to choose to remain under. Husbands are told, or wives are told to submit to the husbands. Husbands are told to submit to Christ. Here we're told all of us as church members need to learn to submit to each other. But notice he goes on to say in verse 5, and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. May I remind you that the verb resist and the verb give have an E-T-H ending? Did you know one thing that's going to be true of your father and my father in heaven? If we have pride in our life, God will have just as much punishment. He's going to re the word resist is actually a military term. It literally means to spread yourself out in battle. Now James will talk about that more uh, when we get to that section in chapter 2. Uh, how to pick a fight with God, which is, it, it sounds so stupid. It is, but believers do it all the time. They decide, I'm going to be worldly and I'm going to enjoy the world. And God says, do you realize that when you are a friend of the world, I will resist you. I will literally set myself against you. You become my enemy. Yeah. Humility literally has the idea of low, lowly mindedness. It's not self disparagement. It's not putting yourself down. It's assuming voluntarily a low position before God. Look, look what God said. When you and I clothe ourselves with humility, God will resist the proud, but for you, He will give grace. He will give you plenty of grace. He will constantly give you grace, but if you're humble, or as my Hillbilly pastor would say, from Polk County, humble. Humble. My old pastor couldn't say humble. He'd say humble. That's the way they say it. Yep. Satan loves, loves to find those church members. And by the way, if you're a man, a male, can I tell you something? <laughs> we fellas, we struggle with pride. Now the ladies do too, but can I talk to my brothers? We know we struggle with it. In fact, the biggest jerk I know in this church that struggles with it, well, I saw him this morning in the mirror. And... <laughs> you know Satan? Apparently, he really is good when he roars and the herd moves. He can pick out those unsubmissive, rebellious church members. He can really pick out the ones that are full of themselves in pride. But notice the next thing, verse, as we move on. He says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Isn't it interesting? The word proud literally means to lift up, to puff up like smoke. 
Humble means to be made low to the ground. And when we choose, not just to stay away from Satan, but before our Father, when we choose, Lord, help me to humble. I want to humble myself. God says, when you make yourself low, then He lifts you up. He lifts you up to a position where you, filled with the Spirit of God, may scare Satan. Verse 8, um, 7. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. You know what makes me struggle with pride? The same thing that makes all of you struggle with pride when we're hurt. Or when we don't get what we think we should get. Then all of a sudden we become very careful, full of care. And we've got to solve our life's issues right now. We've got to get back. We've got to make sure that family member understands. But you know what? We don't realize that while we're puffing ourselves up, Satan spots us. Now, he may not come right away, but if you continue and I continue in pride, he says, I got my eye on you. But notice the next one. I move quickly. Sobriety. Verse 8. Be sober. The word sober there has the idea of be calm, clear-headed. A self-controlled, humble life will give you and I the ability to see with a clear mind the danger that may be coming to us. Brethren, if you are excited or distracted by this world's goods, or let me add, this world's social media, I tell our young people all the time, guys, would you please stop looking at social media? We have young people that literally will spend, did you know, I told you this before, the average American teenager spends 8 to 10 hours a day, a day on social media. Teenagers aren't mature enough to understand they only have 24 hours. Boy, when you get older, you, you know what 24 hours means. And our college students are some of the best young men and women, I think, on the planet. But I see them all the time. And they're not just looking, they're doing this. You know what that is? They're just going YouTube after YouTube. And by the way, most of what's coming across their eyes, I'm not saying it's pornography. But it's not God. It's not God's Word. And it distracts them. And I warn our young people. Are you being careful? Are you being sober? But then look at the next one, vigilant. The word vigilant means alert, watchful. And by the way, you and I cannot be on guard about Satan or his demons if we're distracted with this world's thinking, with social media's tampering with our brains. It was Hebert, the Bible scholar, who said Christians should not merely keep themselves awake, but be alert. There's a difference. I know. I teach. I can look into the faces of young men and women. I know their eyes are open. I know they look awake. But you can tell when you're a teacher. Actually, parents know. There's mom with two of her, her daughters. You know. I remember my kids. They'd be looking at me. I'd say, Stephanie, are you listening to what I'm saying? We're told that we need to be not just sober, but alert. There's one more. Verse 9. Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Did you know the word resist here is not the same word resisteth in verse 5. The word that God uses about himself against proud Christians to set in battle, this word here means to stand one's ground. Nowhere in the Bible Contrary to what the Pentecostal and the four square and the charismatic world, not all of them. There's some actually good Pentecostal preachers out there. But I know this charismatic young, they're the TV preachers. They get up, talk about, man, I just got back from a campaign in, in um, Nairobi. And oh, we whooped up on the devil. And I'm thinking, no, you didn't. I remember one guy, uh, preacher, he's getting older now. He talked about, it's always what they did in a, a, a third world country. And there are never any videos. Benny Hinn came back years ago on TBM and was sitting down with Paul and Jam on TV. And um, I just happened to be watching and he sat there and they said, tell, tell us what happened in Africa. Oh, we had this many thousands saved and this many uh, healed. And we had six resuscitations. 
Now, folks, you know what he meant by that. He raised six people from the dead. And I remember sitting there. This is when smartphones, I don't know if they had cameras on the phone. I thought, didn't anybody take a picture? Didn't anybody take a video? They never seem to have pictures or videos. He's a liar. He's a liar. And all the people clapping and amening. Listen, the Bible nowhere tells us to go after Satan. How foolish. Satan is far too powerful and far too mean. But you know what the Bible does say? When he comes to you, you stand your ground. A lot of men are not standing their ground in their marriage now. A lot of women have decided not to stand the ground of their babies, their children, to be a homemaker, to love their husband. A lot of pastors are not standing their ground and fighting for their sheep and preaching the Word of God and studying the Word of God and living a holy life. It seems like Christianity wants to do everything but stand their ground. All God ever said is you don't have to run after Satan. He'll come. But when he comes, stand fast. Resist steadfastly in the faith. It's interesting how Peter ends this section. He kind of adds a note of camaraderie or solidarity when he says, knowing that the same afflictions. You know, Satan goes after a lot of people and he can go after in one day. Who knows how many pastors he could go after. But he says, knowing th that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. You see, folks, you may have come into church and there's things that are happening in you and around you and they scare you. And you wonder, like I have, is this Satan? Is this demonic? But let me tell you something. Peter would remind us when we submit, we're not alone. When we humble ourselves, we're not alone. When we're sober, we are not alone. When we are vigilant, we're not alone. And when we resist, even unto death, we're not alone. Centuries and centuries of believers have proven not their ability to defeat Satan, but God's through us. But God's not going to... Remember, He's going to resist you, but if you are submitted and you're humble, and you're sober, and you're vigilant, and you depend on the power of God to stand your ground, you're going to win every time. James 4 verse 7 says, Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. I'm going to ask you a question in closing. Are you, have you had power against Satan in your life? Or are you right now living, breathing, pray, just waiting? Just waiting. You don't want to hear this, but you may be his next victim. It all depends on how, your attitude this morning. Would you pray with me? Father, the devil does hunt. He's on the hunt right now. The oldest book in our Bible, Job, he came before God and God said, have you Seen my servant Job? So he said, Oh, yeah. <coughs> yeah, he only worships you because you feed him, protect him. And we know the rest of the story. Satan looks for Job's all the time. Lord, he may be looking at someone right now. Are you warning them? Would you do that now, Father? With every head bowed, eye closed. I'm not going to ask for an invitation. I just want to ask my brothers and sisters, did you come today and after hearing God's warning, you say, Pastor, Brother Spencer, I feel like I'm vulnerable. I'm so glad that Peter put this in here and God spoke in my heart directly and I just want you to remember me as you pray and close the service. Oh, Brother Spencer, God's spoken to me clearly. I didn't realize how vulnerable I am right now. Would you pray with me and pray for me? Brother, sister, I will not call you out, but would you give me that privilege? Raise your hand. Just slip your hand up. Thank you. Brother Spencer, I'm vulnerable. If you're here without Jesus Christ, would you please see me at the end of the service? I'd love to open my Bible and show you how you can have the Lord Jesus as your protector, as your power, and as your Savior. Father, we pray that you'd help us now as we have this invitation. 
Brother Don plays a stanza or two. Speak to hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Would you stand with me? Don's going to play just a stanza or two of whatever song he has. Pray for yourself. Pray for each other. Thank you. Um, you uh, can go and be seated. I want to publicly thank Mrs. Jarvis. Mrs. Jarvis, you promised me you'll go home and tell your husband. Thank you, both of you, for being faithful. Your husband's called a shepherd for a reason, and you just happen to be Mrs. Shepherd. Uh, in all the years you've been there, I can't imagine the heartbreaks, the supernatural battles. Pastors and their wives can't share that sometimes. Now, you two daughters, you grew up watching mom and dad, and you felt and saw the pain. Um, can I say what I've always said, and it just works well with this message? Church, you don't have a pastor. You are in danger. That leads me to express what I'd like to just mention will not be long. Um, 